let me ask you a question that uh, many people uh, will take this scripture and as a result of it, change it to want to observe the biblical feast to have to observe. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. And Yeshua is speaking. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what it appears is that if you eliminate any of the commandments of God, uh, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what would your response be to that? In fact, the very next verse says that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, we won't even enter. Uh, of course, I, have, I, I, I take that question on head on in the book, did Jesus abolish the law, did Paul abolish the law, and, or, or is there an obligation of all believers to, to observe every bit of the law? The, the key is first found in, in Matthew 5.17, where Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish law or prophets. Notice he doesn't just say law, law or prophets, but rather to fulfill. He didn't say, I didn't come to abolish, but rather to uphold. He didn't say that. He said, I came to fulfill. So let's step back and ask what that means. Everything having to do with sacrifice, offering, priesthood, approach to God, blood atonement, we don't do that now. We don't have an earthly priest that we go to, an earthly temple that we go to, earthly sacrifices that we offer. Everything it was pointing to, he brought it into its fullness with a once and for all atonement and actually made all of us now priests to God. He took the moral and ethical requirements of the Torah and brought them to a higher level. For example, instead of just talking about adultery, he talked about uh, lusting after a woman in, in someone's heart. And, and then the, the other aspects of the calendar, the, the festivals, etc., the holy days, he takes to a new meaning. For example, the Sabbath, he says, if you want to find rest, come to me and you'll find rest. There's a deeper Sabbath rest we, in, we enter into. The feast start with a mem uh, the memory of, say, the, the exodus from Egypt with the Passover, but now there's the greater exodus, our, our exodus from bondage to Satan, and now we're redeemed, we become the sons of the living God, etc. So, uh, you know, if, if you're going to say, well, no, he meant that literally you've got to keep every commandment, so let's take the commandment that if you have a, a brother who dies without having a child, then you have, and you're married already, you also marry his wife. We're we going to practice that. We're going to practice polygamy. Or, or you've got to go to Jerusalem three times every year. Or you can't sit on certain chairs if a, if a woman... Uh, okay, you've made your point. But what about the Jewish believer in Jesus? Isn't there a greater obligation to observe the biblical festivals? You can say there's a greater calling by, by way of identity and witness. You don't like that word obligation, do you? <laughs> well, listen, that's, that is the problem. When, when Paul said that we're not under the law, he meant we're not under it as a system of justification. We're, we're not under it to lead us to the Messiah. We're not under its condemnation. He says in Romans 7, we no longer serve by the old way of the written code, but the new way of life in the Spirit. So things have changed. There's a, there's a greater reality we've come to. Like one of my friends who's a New Testament scholar said it's like going from the typewriter to the computer. You're stepping up in, into something greater. Now, you may say we feel a sacred calling by God to do this as a, as a point of witness to our community or as identification with our community. Amen, go for it. But the moment you say we're obligated, then we're obligated to do the rest. And hang on, if you don't keep the Sabbath, there's a death penalty. So, I mean, wh where are you going to draw the line? I say draw the line with we have a new and better covenant, which takes the fullness and riches of Torah and brings it into a greater expression through life in the Spirit. And that's certainly the New Testament way. And, and I have to say, my operative word, my key word, and I know it's yours also because I read it in your book, is freedom. Mm-hmm. If there isn't any freedom, if there isn't any liberty, uh, then we don't know the same Messiah, because that's what he came, to give us freedom. And, and look, if, if anyone's listening and they're in a situation where they are being judged, they are being put under pressure, they are being criticized because this is just not written in their heart. We're not, we're not talking about going out and robbing a bank. We're not talking about breaking moral commandments. 
We're not talking about denying the lordship of Jesus. We're, we're talking about, okay, someone's judging you because you don't observe Seventh-day Sabbath, or someone's judging you because you don't keep a certain feast a certain way, or, or you have more freedom in it. Look, Paul addresses that in Colossians 2. He's dealing with some other issues there. But he plainly says, don't let anyone judge you. I'll tell you what, our time is escaping us, but this is such an important book. There's so few Christians and even Messianic Jews that know the answers to these questions. And Michael has spent 35 years researching this subject. We're also including a bonus book, The Ten Jewish Testimonies That God Himself Told Me to Write, the book called They Thought for Themselves, both books available for a donation of $25.